This is Professor Rogers. In this presentation, we look at confidence intervals. Several topics are addressed. Some of the theoretical material on how we estimate the population mean and the difference between the population distribution and the distribution of sample means can be confusing, but we need to cover it in order to understand why we can do what we do. Then we get practical. We learn how to calculate three related statistics, the standard error, the margin of error, and the confidence interval. We also see what SPSS output produces. Here is our problem. We want to know the mean of a population, but we do not want to count every person. We have this problem all the time. If I wanted to know the poverty rate of individuals in the United States, I could contact every person in the country to get the information that I need. But the task is time-consuming and expensive. So what can I do to get a decent estimate? The answer is take a sample. The best estimate we have of the population mean is the sample mean. Any particular sample could be bad, but the more samples I take, the more confident I become of my estimate. We can illustrate these ideas and proceed even further using a simple example based on dice rolls. There are 36 combinations in a pair of die. The distribution has a minimum of 2, known as snake eyes, and a maximum of 12. The shape of the distribution of possible combinations approximates a normal distribution, with a mean of 7 and a standard deviation of 2.5. Of course, we know what the mean of dice rolls is, but let's suppose we didn't know and wanted to find out. One way to find out would be to take a random sample of rolls. I actually did this. I make five samples, each sample with five observations. Right away, you see that I never get a distribution with a mean of 7 and a standard deviation of 2.5. Sample 1, with a mean of 6.6, .6, is my closest approximation to the mean, and sample 3, with a standard deviation of 2.4, is my closest approximation of the standard deviation. However, if I average the means together, I get a mean of 7.1 which is very close to the population mean. In other words, none of my samples individually are close, but collectively my samples are almost spot on. There is some mathematical theory behind what we just saw, and it is the central limit theorem. We get from the central limit theorem two important ideas. First, taking several samples of a distribution should result in a more accurate conclusion than a single sample. We just saw this principle at work when I averaged the mean of the different samples of dice rolls. Second, the central limit theorem claims that the distribution of the sample means will approximate a normal distribution the more samples I take. We see this second idea illustrated here in a histogram of the five sample means of dice rolls. We see that even with only five samples, our distribution of sample means is starting to look like a normal distribution. What we see visually is confirmed by the skewness statistic, which falls well within the range of minus 2 and plus 2. So, if you are following, we now have two different distributions. First, we have our total population of points. This population has a mean of 7 and a standard deviation of 2.5. Of course, I said for purpose of illustration that we do not know the parameters of the population, so I take samples. If I took an infinite number of samples, not just the five that I did, in this presentation the mean of the distribution of the sample means would be 7, consistent with the central limit theorem. The measure of dispersion for the distribution of sample means is not the standard deviation, but is called the standard error. The standard error is mathematically related to the standard deviation of the population distribution. We find it by taking the standard deviation of the population and dividing it by the square root of n. As a result, the distribution of sample means is the same height at the as the population distribution, but is skinnier. 
It turns out that using the distribution of sample means is quite useful when we want to establish confidence in our results. However, the reality is that we usually do not have the population, or even multiple samples. We have only one sample, and we have to do all these things using the data we collected. Our best estimate of the population mean becomes the mean of our sample. Let's pretend that we have only one sample, which is the reality in most cases. So for my illustration, I am taking sample 1 from my group of 5. Sample 1 gives me an estimate of 6.6 .6 for the mean of the population mean. The number is off the, pop, the real population mean, but this fact by itself does not surprise us. Samples do not count every observation, so there is some error. And so I build a hedge. I do not say that the mean of the sample distribution and the population is 6.6, .6, but the population mean falls between two numbers, including 6.6. .6. The first step in building this range is calculating the standard error which we have already learned is the standard deviation divided by n. In my example, the standard error is 1.6. Let me take an important aside here. What we are seeing illustrates the importance of sampling. First, we have to have a good sample, because if the underlying sample is bad, our population estimates will be bad. Second, the more observations we have, the smaller our standard error will be, and thus the more sure we are of the accuracy of our sample mean. Now we are ready to calculate the range of numbers between which we believe that the true population mean lies. We call this range the confidence interval. As we work through how to create this interval, we will look at the picture of a normal distribution. First, we assume that the mean of the population is the mean of our sample which is represented on the graph by putting 6.6 .6 where the mean should be. Next, we calculate the margin of error. The margin of error is the standard error multiplied by a coefficient called t. What is t, you say? t, or more proper, properly student's t, or student's critical t, refers to a distribution of values. Here is a t-table with those values. I made this t-table from Wikipedia, so I did not have to deal with copyright issues, but any statistical textbook has this table in some form. The left column is our row labels. These numbers are the degrees of freedom with which we are working. As with the standard deviation, the degrees of freedom are calculated as n minus 1. The top column describes the level of accuracy we seek to achieve. This chart refers to our test as two-sided. Two-sided means we intend to stretch our confidence interval out evenly on each side of the mean, in contrast to some other tests that are one-sided. In terms of the picture, the result is that we do not account for every possible value, because we think accounting for all possible scenarios is not feasible. Two-sided tests drop the most extreme scenarios. We then find the column of the confidence interval that we want. The convention in social science is to use a 95% confidence interval. That is, out of all the possible values of the mean, we should be accounting for 95% of them. We can also think of this as the area under the curve of our distribution. We are accounting for 95% of the area under the curve. You may recall from discussions of the normal distribution that 95% of the points fall within approximately two standard deviations of the mean. In my presentation of this, I said two, but I accurately put 1.96 on the slide as the value of the z-score where this occurs. As our degrees of freedom move toward infinity, t converges on z, and we see the 1.96 at the bottom of the column. For our sample, we have five observations, or four degrees of freedom. So from the 95% column, we pick 2.776 to be our t coefficient. I will round t to 2.8 for the sake of convenience. Here we multiply the t of 2.8 and the standard error of 1.6 together to get a margin of error of 4.5. We can now say that our estimate of the population mean is 6.6, .6, with a margin of error of plus or minus 4.5. 
Finally, we calculate our 95% confidence interval. The low end is 6.6 .6 minus 4.5, or 2.1. The high end is 6.6 .6 plus 4.5. I am now 95% sure that my population mean lies between 2.1 and 11.1. Notice how I wrote the confidence interval, CI, with the range in parentheses. If you know anything about dice rolls, you know that this prediction is not that good. But keep in mind that our estimate is based on a small sample size, and that is what we had to use. Usually our sample size is much larger, which gives us a smaller confidence interval and an assurance of greater accuracy than we have here. The SPSS output from numeric variables from the frequencies command helps us considerably. Here we see the standard error of 1.6 is calculated for us. As we move into more advanced statistics, where we use the confidence interval to determine statistical significance, we will find even more information provided, and there will be no need to manually look up students' t in a t-table. In this presentation, we learned to use the sample mean and standard deviation to estimate the mean of the population. From this, we can develop a confidence interval describing the population mean. This knowledge is an important step toward the concept of statistical significance, which appears with inferential statistics.